is six year old. Uh, my four year old has autism. We found that out two years old, uh, two, when he was two. And so I learned a little bit, I learned a lot actually in the last two years. So that's why I'm here today. <laughs> Great. Um, so um, our first question, uh, Yanling, is how do you describe your child with regard to typical emotions and feelings? How does your child affect your emotions or make you feel? And how mm -hmm. does your child show his emotions? How do people describe your child? Um, if you ask that question, let's say a year ago, the answer would be completely different. But nowadays, if you ask me, every time I come home, after my 12 meetings today, <laughs> I'll come home and see him jumping. Most typically, he's jumping on the tambourine. We have a jump uh, tambourine uh, in the living room. And every time I open the door, he's most likely jumping there and then screaming, excited. And then he didn't call me, but I can see he's really happy to see me. And that makes me feel really great. All the things just gone and I'm just happy to be home with him. Yeah. And then the people who actually know my son a little bit more now, every time they talk to me, they say, oh my God, he's so happy. He's such a happy child. Yeah. So that's where he is now. But if you ask me when he was two years old, it's a completely different story. So the story is that because he would be screaming all day long, all night long, nonstop. Yeah, he stopped because he got so tired. So he had to stop for 15 minutes and then start screaming again, day or night. And the only way that can calm him down and not screaming was to have a car ride. So sometimes I'll be driving him in my car 1 a.m. <laughs> And then I would try to stay awake and then drive and then he would stop screaming. And yeah, but now he's a completely different person. I'm so happy about that. And yeah. Wow, that's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, how do you describe your child with regard to preferred socialization style or connections with people or animals and your friends? What does, what does he seek out for fun or relaxation? Uh, so fun, he really likes music. So music is really key to his life. Uh, one of the really funny things was that when he was almost two, not yet two, and we didn't really have the diagnosis about autism yet. And the doctor at some point even said, maybe you should really have a thorough uh, hearing testing because they think maybe he's deaf. That's why he's not talking, he's not communicating. Just when we talk about, yeah, maybe we should make an appointment and then he started to hum a song, <laughs> the Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. <laughs> oh, no. so then we know, oh, he's not deaf, <laughs> and that's <laughs> evidence. And then another thing about music is that even though sometimes when he's upset or unhappy or really want to do something, we couldn't go, for example, it's raining outside, he want to play outside, say we can, and he'd be upset. But then the moment I turn on the music, he's happy, and then dancing and smiling. So yeah, music is really key for him. Uh, and then socialization, yeah, he, yeah, I'm his, he's happy when I'm around. <laughs> and he's really attached to quite a few people around him. And he really, when he likes you or trusts you, he will show his emotion in a way that's kind of maybe unique in that because he cannot really talk like, you know, a typical four-year-old, but he will use his chin and push his chin on me, on my face, anywhere, really hard. <laughs> but that's his way to say, I love you. Mm. And he would do that to me. He would do that to a nanny who has been working with him for about two years now. And he would do that to his, little bro his your older brother and yeah, some people. So. He physically touches his chin. Yeah, he presses it really hard on my, sometimes my nose, sometimes here. <laughs> yeah. it sounds very familiar. <laughs> And some people, if they don't know, say, oh, he's kissing you. How cute. No, no, it's not kissing. But yeah, wow. I know that that's the way to say I love you. I want to be, you know, touching. You know. Yeah. Wow, that's very charming. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. Let me see what our next, um, our next question for you says, how do you um, describe your child's favorite activities, behavior conditions, pleasurable activities, things that soothe him, anything that brings him happiness or joy? Uh, so I talk about music, I talk about jumping, uh -huh. <laughs> and that's why we have a trampoline at, in the living room, right in the center, when you open the door, that's the first thing you see, uh, so he can jump. Uh, and then he loves going out to the beach, 
and whenever so that's why every weekend if you are on my facebook feed you know that whenever the weather is nice we'll be out on the beach or somewhere or in a park he just loves being outdoor uh, somehow being in an open space with nature with the ocean that just makes him happy wow. he will be happy whenever he's outside uh, yeah and he can stay on the beach and keep running around there all day long does he like to play alone on the beach or does he like to just roam or is he, does he want to take you with him? Um, most of the time he likes to be by himself. I feel like he had lots of pleasure, just him with the environment. Uh -huh. uh, but now he's involving us a bit more now. And then he also pay attention oh, now okay. to me and yeah, Lang, my six year old. Uh -huh. So I think it's nice to see that that's starting to emerging. Yeah. Oh, that's great. That's mm -hmm. cool. That's what we're, we're interested in these things. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm curious about the kinds of music. Does he have any preferences? Any specific um, sounds that he prefers? Rhythms? Or is it just any music? Uh, he does have a particular kind because we use the yeah, old-fashioned Pandora radios. <laughs> uh, sometimes we have different kind of music, but I think that the kind he likes still are the children's music. So if, for example, if we play some pop or some classic music or something else, it can't, it's less effective. He doesn't mind them. But when he's upset, the only thing that can actually calm him down are the children's music. Yeah. Nice. Mm -hmm. Does he sing along with the music? Uh, yes. And he will actually sing with me now. So that's something I'm really happy. For example, I will be singing, say, uh, the people on the bus go, and then he will say, ah, 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 yeah, like, up oh, and down. Yeah, so he can help me fill out the blanks now, yeah. Uh -huh. oh, okay, okay. Wow, that's awesome. <laughs> I love that. And also, when, when he's uh, bouncing on the trampoline, mm -hmm. is he listening to music then too? Yes, I believe so. Because sometimes you can even feel kind of the rhythm is following the music, yeah. That's perfect. Mm -hmm. Well, our next question is sort of similar. It says, does your child have a special like or attachment to objects such as movies, pictures, or music? Mm -hmm. Or does your child find pleasure or enjoyment in materials like sand, water, sensory elements, light or sound, or even special rooms or physical mm -hmm. places? Yeah, so definitely he loves the sand. So that's why beach and sand and water, actually. Mm. So in the shower, in the bathtub, I will have to pull him up otherwise you can stay there forever <laughs> yeah he's fascinated with the running water with the sound of it do you think or is it just the sensory that or does he like to touch water in general the wet yeah i think the the sense of the touching it because it doesn't have to have the sound but he's happy also on the beach even though he's not touching the water so i'm not sure it's the sand or maybe the sound of the wave it could be both yeah and, and have you noticed uh, at home or on the beach that he uh, perhaps, does he prefer uh, playing, with, um, touching uh, certain materials? Mm -hmm. Yeah, he does to like to grab some of the sand and then feel the sand between her, his fingers. You sometimes actually watch the sand drop between the fingers. Mm -hmm. And then he also, yes, yeah, water, sand, uh, there's something else. Oh, books. <laughs> It's really funny. He has maybe about 100 different books now. <laughs> uh, but it, yeah, and he just loves, initially, I think earlier he just flipping through. It's more about touching the paper. It's less than looking, reading a book. But now he's actually paying more attention to the contents now. But he still really like, I can see that he was doing this, feel the paper and different kind of texture there. And sometimes you make it so hard that you actually had a hole on the page and now I have just tape it. Okay, continue. <laughs> yeah. And then I have one more question that I'm curious about mm -hmm. is the, um, does he uh, like expressing his chin to other things than um, you or your, or the family? Is it something that he does only with people or also with other things that he really likes? It's only with people that he really Trust. loves, yeah. trusts and love. yeah. <laughs> How interesting, wow. Yeah. Let's see, um, let's, where am I at? Um, he, number five, how do you describe your child's enhanced abilities that exceed the abilities of others? 
Uh, do they have a special skill or talent that is out of the ordinary? Uh, have they shown ingenuity in overcoming what we might consider a problem or obstacle? So are, are there things that we have done that you think are very exceptional or en enhanced? Uh, so I think that he can, he has so much energy. <laughs> he can jump on the trampoline for maybe half an hour nonstop. And then with the big smile and so excited, nonstop and so excited and so happy and jumping for so long. And uh, if it's me, I'll get tired already <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> after some time. Uh, so that's one thing. And then I think another thing is that little things will make him feel so happy. And seeing that excitement in his eyes, you can see the speckles and the huge smile. And I think it's just great. Yeah, I know that maybe lots of little kids are like that because I also have a six year old. But that's like, that kind of excitement, I think, is a lot more profound or a lot more deep, much deeper, I feel, than a typical same age children. Wow. That's so, and I think and it's a very kind of almost contagious because I feel that excitement and that makes me excited as well. So, so his, his joy brings you joy then. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, that's terrific, Kim. Mm -hmm. Can I have a, a question about the, you say little things. And you, you mentioned the jumping and the music and the speech. What kind of little things that seem uh, perhaps insignificant for us, but are very important for him that create, that give him joy and happiness? And then and other stages, because suddenly you notice that he noticed something small. Mm -hmm. it, it makes you notice it too. That yeah, actually, for why he will be staring at our bookcase. We have a gigantic four by four IKEA that huge bookcase, and he will be staring at that, or sometimes he stare at the floor in front of it. And for why I have no idea what he's looking at, and he's so focused, so engaged. And then I realized it's probably the light because the sun hitting and then there's something there, the reflections. I'm thinking probably that's why because there's some other places when I notice if the sun shines, shining something and it creates some shadow, he also pay really close attention to them. And he'll be really engaged with, with those. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. That's, mm -hmm. that's an interesting too, that, that sensory, those mm -hmm. light and shadow. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Okay. Um, our next question says, what special knowledge does your child have? What have you learned from your child? What enhanced skill does your child have that people have noticed? Um, what, what have you learned about the world or about yourself or about Yi from being with him? Uh, so I think in terms of about special skills, because he's still really young, a four-year-old. So yeah, besides the, you know, tons of energy, <laughs> Tons of happiness now, and then that. Um, I'm not sure how much more I know at this point, so maybe years later I can find out more. But yeah, I think at this point, these sort of things I already talk about those. But in terms about how he changed me, it's actually a huge change in me. Um, the first year when I found out he has autism, it's the first time in my life I all of a sudden I realized. I don't know, every time I go on the airport or airplane, you hear the things to say, oh, put the oxygen mask on yourself before you put on the children, right? In the past, as a mother, it's like, my, it doesn't make sense. I said, of course, make sure he, he has enough oxygen before I do it on myself. But now I kind of understand that now because, and that actually leads me to believe that my own happiness is actually really, really important. And... Yeah, so he helped me understand that I need to make sure I'm happy before I can make him or any, make anyone else around me happy. And that also led me to make a big a career change in my life as well. Because before he has autism, before I know that he has autism, I never thought about I want to be a manager at all. <laughs> Somehow, most people feel, of course, I want to be a manager or director or VP or, you know, C, whatever, O, or something, right? The higher title, the better. But somehow for me, because I just love design so much, and I've been working in design for so long, but I still felt I just love design. So I never think about being a manager. But somehow with him, with this, changed my mindset. All of a sudden, I feel like now I want to be a manager because 
it's something new I want to try and also because it gave me a chance to help grow other people. Because I have tons of experience now working as a professor in the past in school, universities, tons of industry experience, working in different companies, working on different products. And I feel like I have a lot to share. Why I should just keep that to myself and then I'm the star of the designer and everybody feel like, oh, he's just awesome. I feel like I, now I want to share all this with someone else. And the best way for now in my career or where I am now is to become a manager. Then I can support more people in my team and I can spread the knowledge I have and help people become a better designer. Um, but somehow that was just not something I thought about at all before E, <laughs> before the condition. So, yeah. Would you wow, say that's, that's awesome. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> Who would have thought that your child could make that kind of, you know, yeah. that's, that's terrific. Yeah. So, what yeah, goals or dreams do you have for Yi? And what do you think he, he dreams about? Yi? I know he's young, but mm -hmm. what do you see for his future? Oh, I do have, I think I see Charlie have a question. Oh. Should I do it? I can keep it to the end or, um, or ask it now. I can hear you? Yeah, yeah. you can uh, I was just wondering if, um, this, uh, I mean, his birth gave, or having him is, was a transformational um, mm -hmm. moment for you and brought your uh, cool ability out as a manager and mm -hmm. sharing your own um, strengths mm -hmm. and uh, experience with the world and somehow something in him brought something in you mm -hmm. out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you, do you see that as part of your joy? Yes, it is. And another thing I also feel like because of him, I feel like I have much more empathy now. <laughs> I don't think I, I was a bad person in the past. I will feel, you know, when someone, I see someone have an unfortunate life, I feel sorry for them. But in the past, I, it's much a shallow surface. I was like, oh, I feel sorry for you. But I don't feel sorry enough to do anything about it. And now I feel when I see people in certain situation and I'm more inclined to do something about that. So I see myself actually now taking more actions, either small or big, maybe still small, <laughs> but I would like to do something about it now rather than say, oh, I'm sorry for you. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. I will actively think about, is there anything I can do about this? Either by, you know, making more people aware or maybe by promoting them, helping them financially or other way or yeah, whatever. So I think that's also a big change since Yi as well. So he has actually changed me in lots of different ways now. And I feel like I'm become a much better person, I hope, because of that. <laughs> so yeah. You were always a great person. <laughs> <laughs> I was okay, I guess. <laughs> <That's terrible>. <laughs> That's terrific. Other questions for Yin Lang before we go on to our next one? Um, I had a question as far as your work with Facebook and everything is concerned. Um, and if you became a manager right after you started understanding that he has autism, did you start designing and um, adjusting your work life differently? because of the autism so like when you're doing like interfaces do you see them differently because you want them to be able to be adaptable to people with autism yeah i think it, it is something i actually think quite a lot because i'm a designer so it's very natural when i see for example now he's engaging with those ipad ads yeah and when i see some of those uh, as i i was thinking I should change it because now I know how I can customize that or change the way it's layout and organized to make it more effective because most of those apps they're not designed for people like E. It's just for typical age children, but that actually happened to be good for him too, but not good enough. And also the things like the packs. Yeah, Deborah, I know what I'm talking about, those little images. <laughs> they were horrible. <laughs> Uh, so lots of my the speech therapies they use a lot of them and then I just couldn't see I couldn't take it anymore so I make my own right. and I create my own template make, <laughs> and I bought the whole printer the laminator you know the whole package so I can make my own packs and I actually thinking about I already make all those I have all this template how can I share it out and so other people can use them too and the same with the mobile apps uh, or maybe iPad iOS apps is that 
I don't, I haven't done it yet. But at the back of my mind, I've been thinking about maybe at some point I should set aside some time to actually design those apps. And my husband, he's an engineer. Maybe he can code them and then we can launch them. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. So how would you, I'm actually doing an iPad app. So just quick, how would you, what like little adjustments that would you make that would help the kid with autism better? Than yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So what than normal. I think it also depends on the age of the, uh, the development stage is okay. that, for example, now I'm teaching him simple concepts like colors, the so red versus green versus yellow or whatever color. And those apps, they would jump very quickly to ask him to choose from two and then three and then four and then five too quickly. But I would rather to say, can I control always to pick one from two options? Yeah. until we make sure he really learned those. And then I can say, okay, now he can try to pick one from three or four rather oh. than let the app to automatically just switch to those random, yeah. And numbers. have to have more control and less overwhelming um, mm-hmm. flow of information. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That'd be like a, a discrete child training method where mm-hmm. you uh, start with one known and then add a second known and then when it's yep. mastered, add a third and then... Yep. And then also in terms of the layouts, because those apps tend to, they try to look cute, right? So they have lots of colorful background, this and that. So it's just too much distractions as well for my son, because he cannot really see what I'm asking him about. So if there are too many things around the shapes, then he might see the other things on the corner and say, I don't know what you're asking me to talk about. (laughs) There's so many things here. Okay. So things like those. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. It helps a lot. Mm -hmm. Our next oh. Is, oh, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, Deb, do you want to go? <laughs> <laughs> and, and we will definitely take questions as we're able. Um, what goals or dreams do you have for Yi um, in the future? Uh, so to answer that question, I need to talk about my parents first. <laughs> uh, it's probably hard to, for you to believe. I actually have three degrees. I was a professor in school at some point, and now I'm design manager at Facebook, seemingly quite accomplished. But if I tell you, my mom was only in school for four years in her entire life. Wow. <laughs> you probably wouldn't believe that, but that's true. And then my, yeah, my dad only went to school for nine years. Uh-huh. That's it. Wow. Uh, so partly because of that, but also partly somehow they have the free spirit. So they actually, they don't plan anything for me. Since I was second grade in school, they don't care about, they, not that they don't care about, they don't get involved with my school work at all. They just trust me completely to let me do whatever I want. And that turns out that's great for me. So I actually become, yeah. <laughs> well, well, yeah. no, well, so I think not sure because of that. I also feel like I don't want to plan too much for him because he can plan for his own future. He can decide what he wants. But of course, I need to give him the support and help make sure he can actually do that better. But I don't like to be say this is your next step and that's what you should be doing. You should become a doctor or you should become a lawyer or whatever. And otherwise, I won't be a designer because back in the ninety whatever in China. Design is not a thing. <laughs> no. <laughs> right? no. mm-hmm. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. Oh, that, that's a great answer. I, I think that's the best answer you could give. Uh, but I do actually have hope. My hope is that I, I do hope I can learn what I need to learn so I can provide the environment for him so he can maximize his potentials. Yeah, so I think that is my goal. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, our question, the final question, formal question we have is, does the concept of cool abilities change the way you view your son? I actually really like the name because it actually match what I, match my belief really well. Um, I know that initially some people actually make me really sad to see some other parents. I can see them sometimes in public. I know that oh, that's a son has, that's some children has autism. I can see that. And somehow when they have certain behavior, I can see on their parents' face, you can see they feel ashamed or they feel like they have to, you know, run away very quickly. And so no one can see they're embarrassed or whatever. But of course, 
that's not always sometimes they have to hide so they create a good environment for the yeah to protect the children but sometimes i do see that they run away because they feel ashamed um but for me i don't i just i just don't think like he's i will feel ashamed of my son that's who it is and i love him for whatever he is and now having this cool ability is that like, yeah that's cool <laughs> so <laughs> i mean would it be helpful in any way to say i have a cool label i mean my my child has cool ability yeah side by side by his autism and whatever is uh typical for uh, i don't like even to say typical because i think that yeah. people with autism have a lot of different styles and uh -huh. so yes. i don't think that they fall into the same mm -mm. rubric there yep but yeah so that's very encouraging to hear thank you yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that. Now I have a term I can use. <laughs> yeah. Do you feel like this is empowering? You have now. Yeah. Yeah. You got onto. Yes, mm -hmm. so I feel the same way. Yeah. So um, I, I would love to open up some questions to our students. We have a lot of students on tonight, and is I'm I'm so glad to see all of you here tonight. Um, this is a great opportunity for you guys to ask questions, both of Yenling and Hallie and, um, and even your classmates with regard to some of the cool abilities and the things we're discussing. So um, would somebody like to ask a question? Yeah, I'll ask a question. Okay, Kevin. Hey, uh, Kevin here. Um, I was just wondering if there's any apps that uh, your son uh, uses by any chance. Uh, I can run and grab it right now. <laughs> I can't remember the name. Yeah, please uh, do. Okay. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Thank you. Okay. She has many beautiful things she can show us, drawings and things that he's made, all sorts of things. <laughs> That's a great question because it gives a clue of what he's Mm -hmm. uh, so I think it really depends on which try you're talking about because it depends on where they are now. There are different apps that will fit them better. But for my son at the moment, there's an app called uh, Sound Touch. So it's one word. There's no space in between. So it's Sound and Touch merged together. And then Sound Touch 2. They are also really good. And then there's one called Music Color. These three are one package, but three different apps. Uh, I felt like they're really great for my son at this point because it has music. I don't know. It's probably really hard to see. Okay. Okay. Oh, okay. So you see some animals here and there are lots of different categories down there. And what's nice about that is that, for example, if I see a dog, I can tap on the dog. It makes the sound of the dog. But it also shows you multiple pictures of different kinds of dogs. So it helped to generalize the concept of, because it would be very easy if you show him the same picture every time. So say dog, then he would see, oh, this is the only thing that's a dog. Everything uh -huh. else that doesn't look like that is not a dog. <laughs> uh, so I think that is, in that sense, really nice. And then also the one here, the music color thing, is very simple. It's different music squares, and then you can touch one, it will have music. But then it also have lots of different images with the same color. And that's also something he really likes to play with because he likes the music, he likes to touch, he can learn the color, but also learn a different kind of objects with that color as well. And the same kind of generalization. So when you see an apple, it's not just a red apple. You can have a green apple, yellow apple, many apples, one apple. And so that's also really helpful. Uh, and there's another app called Easy Busy. So the song Easy Busy. Uh, one of the apps he's playing a lot now uh, one of the, so this is how it looks like. Yeah, the name is called ECBC. Uh, there are multiple different things you can play with it and some teach you numbers. The one he's really, really enjoying now is the counting one to 10. Uh, so I can show it here. So it asks you to tap, you know, number one when it's showing you three different numbers. And then when you pop, it has the pop sound and the fact and really fun. And he feels so excited after he finished from one to nine. And then he felt like, oh my God, I learned it. He cannot say it, but you can see, you know, that he's, he's really excited. And you can see he's like, <laughs> so, yeah. Does he sign at all? No, because uh, we found out he has apraxia, 
So it's some kind of disorder affecting the muscles, not just affecting the speech, but also the whole body as well for him. Mm -hmm. So that's why even for more, is you're supposed to do this, he can never, no, not never, sorry. <laughs> he cannot do it now, he can do this. Because that's easier so than he this. would make a modified sign. Like he, he could consistently do like that for more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's actually now starting to say more as well. Yeah, we're also yeah, working on the speech. Yeah, the signing sometimes can prime the part of the brain that'll produce speech. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like if he does anything consistently like that, like it's kind of a similar gesture, mm -hmm. that's great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Good job. <laughs> Other questions that you guys have for Yen Ling? Can I ask one? Yeah, of course. Um, so, uh, are there any times that um, you see a kind of an emotion or kind of a behavior that you don't understand what mm -hmm. it means or yep. what you have to react to it? How do you how do you understand his behavior, like by details and like, how do you know what you should do and how you should behave? How do you know all of these? Uh, to be honest, I don't always have the answer. I don't always know because he cannot talk. Uh, he would say maybe 10 different sounds now, but that's about it at the moment. Uh, one night, I remember about two weeks ago, because in the past when he's happy, he's uh, smiling, jumping around. When he's sad, he will be crying. And then, but that night, it was really different. Um, he was sitting on, yeah, we're having dinner. So he's sitting on his high, not high chair, but his, yeah, his chair. And all of a sudden I see tear drops just sliding down his face, but he's not, you know, crying, crying like a little child, little boy, you know, little boy when they cry, they're rah, rah, making sounds, but he's not, he's just sitting there really quiet, but really sad. And with the tear coming down his cheek and then he go, to, went to his bed, lay down in the bed, continued to cry like that and it makes me feel really sad because I know that he feels really sad but it's not the normal kind of sad that he has and I also feel like that kind of expression is something and in a way I can see that he's growing up now because he's no longer a little baby that's more like adults right you are trying to cry but you're in front of public you don't want people to see you crying that kind of cry and I felt really sad, but I had no idea what's going on. And I don't, yeah, I didn't really ask because I know he cannot answer. If I ask, I might just make him feel more frustrated. So all that I did, I was just lying down with him. And then, yeah, just to show him, I'm here. Mom, maybe always, always be here no matter what. Yeah, she would just make him feel comfortable, but yeah. I love that. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. It's also a, a sign that he's growing because his emotions are not limited to uh, two, that his sadness becomes different kind of sadness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what would, so it's when actually he's enlarging his repertoire mm -hmm. of emotions. Yeah. So that's just the positive side of even though it, I mean, it, that, it breaks your heart as a mom because you don't know what makes him sad, but it's a different kind of sad that you haven't seen before. And that means that his emotional world is growing. Yes, yes. Well, I like the idea that you respond, he responds kind of physically, that you responded physically back. Mm -hmm. And that, that being close to him or touching him, as opposed to using words that he can't use. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like you develop a, a nonverbal language together. Mm -hmm. That becomes yeah. a bit of a shared narrative. Mm -hmm. So I think you did the right thing. <laughs> it's hard, isn't it? It's very hard. Mm -hmm. Other questions that you guys have? These are great questions, by the way. I have a question about verbalization. Mm -hmm. Do you verbalize for him? when you see something uh, yes say i can see that you really like this or i see even though if you don't know something what made him sad you can say you can see that something i, I see what you're feeling i see that you're sad mm -hmm. it's just i mean the fact that he's not verbal you, you you know that he understands or he feels you in a certain way yes yeah i do uh 
model for him. Yeah, so even though he cannot say something when he pointing at something, for example, if he pointing an apple, I said, oh, you want an apple? And but I would keep my sentence really short or as short as possible. In the past, I would just say apple rather than do you want apple. I'm slowly increasing that more because I feel like now he's actually understand more. Yeah. So on that night, I didn't ask him why because I know it doesn't help if I ask him why. But I say, oh, you're sad. I'm sorry, you're sad. But mom is here. Uh, so I say things like those. And yeah, I try to label things for him whenever I can and keep it really short or keep it to a way that he can understand. Uh, yeah. How does your son interact with um, your other son, right? Because they're around the same age and they're in that very play group. Uh, yes. Yeah. So a year ago, my six-year-old did not exist for him. <laughs> for Yi, it's like no one else. I don't care. You are not there. You are not my brother. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, he just didn't see him. Yeah. Even my six-year-old actually really loves him. He always said, "Oh my God, Yi is so cute. I love him." And then he would try to hug him, but then you would just push him away. <laughs> um, but now I think they are starting to in interact with each other. And that makes me feel so happy. I remember very clearly last, I think it was around summertime or maybe September-ish. They were both, we say, oh, let's go to the park because every weekend I try to bring them to the park or somewhere. And instead of just them following behind me, I saw them holding hands together. Mm. For the first time, I was like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> it was so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it made me feel so happy. I almost cried. I was like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> <That's my hope. laughs> yes. Uh -huh. And then actually now I'm actually putting them in the same bed and let them sleep together. And I felt that's actually a good way for them to build the bonding more. And so every time they go to bed together, they will hug each other. And yeah, sometimes he still push them away. But yeah, at least they hug at each other sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I'm interested, um, the students that we have here tonight, mm -hmm. when you listen to Yen Lang talk about cool, the cool abilities that you have, what are some abilities that you're hearing as you're learning about Yen Lang's son? Anybody? <laughs> I, I'm, I'm a little confused if... Um, separating the just extreme happiness and excitement if that's a personality thing like if he would be mm -hmm. like that if he didn't have autism or not or if that's uh mm -hmm. his only way of really expressing emotion is just being super excited so I think that might be something in there and another cool abilities I would say would be just the awareness that he has for the environment that he's in I think that you've, the way you describe the beach is very much like he's very aware of what's going on. Mm -hmm. uh, so for your first question, because my six-year-old is also someone that when people want to pick him up, all the teacher, all the people around him say, oh my God, Lang is such a happy child. He's the one smiling nonstop. So I do have two really happy ch children, but I can see that his happiness is a lot more intense in a way. I mm -hmm. felt like in his world, maybe he's a, a lot more pure, not pure, but what's the word? Uh, I don't know how, yeah, what's the right word here? But I feel like the happiness is 10 times more than, okay. you know, like other children. Even though Lang is already the happiest try in his class. Mm -hmm. <laughs> in every single class he's been to, he's always the one that smiles the most. And yeah. But he is 10 times more than that. So. <laughs> and then your second question about awareness. Uh, actually, he was not aware about his environment at all until he's almost three. It oh, took okay. us a full year. We worked really hard to break him outside of his own bubble. Before that, he was completely in his own bubble. He would knock into a uh, table. Even the table was right in front of him, just one inch apart. He would just walk right into it as if it's not there. And even I just try to shake something right next to his ear, he will, will like, it's nothing's there. He won't hear, he, yeah, he just didn't hear anything. And so it took us really long time to finally break that apart. And then he can, oh, I can feel my environment now. And I think that's partly why he was screaming a lot in the past because he constantly felt insecure. I feel like he felt really scared. 
he didn't know what's going on and yeah it's maybe about that and then once he's outside his bubble then he can say oh mommy is there she'll help me and i think that calms him down to say i don't need to be scared as much anymore so that's awesome <laughs> anybody else have a cool ability observation from what you've heard tonight Would anybody like to tell uh, about your project that hasn't shared already? Got a lot of different projects going on. Okay. Anybody? Um, Kelly, do you have additional questions for you? I have very many questions. <laughs> 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 yeah um mostly if um if you think that um to, if, if you think about the design for uh for his strengths mm -hmm. which means not a design that comes to uh necessarily enhance uh social interaction mm -hmm. or something but something that purely will give it which will be a fun toy mm -hmm. for him to to explore mm -hmm. and i know that i mean already you know he likes music he likes the trampoline he likes certain apps mm -hmm. in which direction would you take it oh. i don't really know <laughs> that's a hard one yeah that's a hard one I... maybe that's a question for the students too if you mm -hmm. would have to design something for the strengths of being, what would be, what would that be? Yeah, so I think one thing I would do is that, oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, one thing I would find that initially we work with, by now we work with so many different therapies now, and we find the most effective ones are the ones that you follow his interest. So if you're trying to make him say, just follow the lesson, we have a fixed curriculum, just follow that, it won't work at all. <laughs> Zero effect. But if we follow him and then see his you know, interest at something and we teach that something to him, that will be a lot more effective. But I think that's also much more challenging in terms of design because when you're designing, most of the time you have something a bit more like a template or a more fix rather than oh we can change on the setting but i think it's still possible so to think about what are the things you can do with your design so it's flexible enough that it can be customized based on the situation the child is in based on the level they're in or based on yeah who they are interacting with so what are the things you can do to make it more flexible more yeah so that people can customize it i think that could be one direction to try yeah Mm -hmm. Oh, you're muted. We can't hear you. <laughs> Sorry. Do we have another question? And specifically, I mean, and specifically for him, what would be, I mean, if he was jumping just out of the blue, if mm -hmm. he was jumping on a trampoline that could also make music, would this be fun? Oh, yes. Definitely. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, if we, um, if the trampoline had, uh, or if he would have a sandbox that would uh, give an answer to to his uh, to the fun that he has with sand, with sand and something with light going through this, would that be like something that he would enjoy? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. So. This is what I was uh, thinking. I think it's a very good direction, Hallie, um, because oftentimes we spend so much time trying to remediate or change people. That's what I'm saying. And with typical children, we never do that. We try to find their pleasure abilities and we try to make very pleasurable experiences without necessarily trying to change them. Mm -hmm. And there are many people that feel it's fundamentally wrong or unethical to change you, but you are the person you were meant to be and that you own your own desires and your own ability to choose. 
So I think that's a. Um, I know. think that side of just for my the way I um, my experience with children. I think that side by side by the toys that are supposed to convey, you know, that they teach you something and that you define and you learn this and you learn that. There's also the just the meaning that we don't know always because some children, I mean, are nonverbal or they're too young or they're just not. And they need to play and we don't know what they see or what they feel and which pattern and what is there going on inside their their inner world but it still gives them a lot it's just that we don't understand something yeah mm -hmm. maybe we need things and to train us to understand them that's mm -hmm. what i'm that's from my experience with many 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 kids this is what i believe but i believe that also for adults and that's not contradicting other designs and other things that are remedial or supposed to uh, help the communication or this or that it's side by side Design yeah. for the strength, design for the mobility. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we can teach other <laughs> If the fascination is with patterns or with light, or, I mean, if somebody sees light in a totally different way than we do, especially with young children, we, they can't convey. It's their world. They see through their eyes. They don't even know that they see it in a different way. That's but they see something that we don't. Mm -hmm. And that can be genius in itself. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I mean, it's the... So we're yeah. sort of stripping away our own biases. Yes, and that mm -hmm. goes to design also of regular toys. It's, I mean, it's always biased by who mm -hmm. we are and what we think. Even I'm biased with cool abilities, right? I, I certainly think that they are there <laughs> and I'm happy to be biased this way, but <laughs> I mean, so there's, we come more full circle too. starting. I think Yenling, do you feel like you have changed? I think you said that like that you changed in your view of your son and you've grown mm -hmm. with him and you've grown to accept him and maybe even, you know, see beauty in him that you never would have seen without him, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's less about I, the way I see him change. It's more about the way I see myself that has been changing a lot more. Yeah. Uh, because he's so cute. So <laughs> I love him all the way through. Uh, even though in the middle of the night, I was driving at 1 a.m., crying, driving, and I was sleepy, and, but I still love him. <laughs> uh, so I feel like the way, the way I see him just hasn't changed at all. It's just more about how he's affecting myself and how I see myself. That's changing a lot. Nice. Yeah. Terrific. I noticed in a lot of um, parents, like you go out to a restaurant or something like that, and the parents are kind of like ashamed of their children because they're loud and noisy yep. or just playful. And so they give them like, there's so much technology out there. So they'll download apps and give them games to play with and everything. Um, but I, I would assume, especially with the parents that are a little bit of ashamed or they seem to be ashamed of their children, do you think that they get more on screen app time trying to like quiet their child down or that the, the child doesn't respond to the, the app time so much because it's only one or two dimensional? Uh, I think each child is different. Some will really respond to the iPad really well and some don't. Okay. And also, even with the same iPad or iPhone, some maybe respond really well to music. Or if you play some YouTube music, they will love it. But maybe some will only respond if you show them a video game or something else. Yeah. Uh, so it really varies from one child to another. Um, but I can see why that some parents say, oh, because most of the children, they give him something digital, they would just yeah. quiet. <laughs> yeah. So maybe for them, they might see that's an easy way out. Uh, so it's more about the environment, what we can do about our environment. Because even for me now, I will pick restaurants. There's some I don't go. If I see some of them, they're fancy, you know, people in high heels and suits. And then with some, you know, then I just, okay, I'm, I don't even bother to go there. <laughs> <laughs> because I know that in that kind of setting, actually we try that once. And some people will just give you the dirty look. Even I don't feel ashamed, but they will give you dirty look. You just don't feel you're welcome there. And then why bother to stay there if you're not welcome? 
and, and it's not like I don't have other options. So I would rather go to places that are more, you know, family friendly or people are more, yeah, less mean about that. Uh-huh. <laughs> Yeah, because I know some people that really don't like screaming children nearby, and yeah. Yenling, does does he listen on headphones? No, he, he doesn't not. like anything tight sensory or like earbuds. No, no, no. <laughs> some some of the kids are sound sensitive, like against like mm-hmm. sharp sounds mm-hmm. and like that, and so they'll wear earbuds. To- uh, he is the opposite. He's undersensitive to a lot of things. So he wants that. Yeah. Yes. Ah, it's yeah. also the jumping. Yes. Yeah, he's seeking out those sense. Yeah, the motion and yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. It's so the in the in inside um, uh, w- balance. Yeah. <laughs> yes. 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 Yeah. Yeah, needs the yeah. The, and I feel like in a way, the way the reason he touched me with his chin so hard is because otherwise he couldn't feel it. I felt like it's his, because he's undersensitive to touch to sound to light to a lot of things and he need to press it so much harder that he can actually feel it and feel me. And yeah, so. <laughs> that also has to do with, um, uh, with uh, eating actually, with the feeling of uh, hunger and, um, and how full you feel because mm-hmm. uh, if, if you need more pressure, mm-hmm. then you might need more time to feel that you ate enough. <laughs> okay, yes. Mm-hmm. It can be. Some, sometimes because we have so many nerves in the stomach. Mm. It's funny. My son will touch forehead. So he touches forehead to forehead. Uh-huh. Reminded me of your chin to... <laughs> How cute. I know, right? Kind of. And it's almost like it's, there's the sensation in the face is important. Mm-hmm. It's they... interesting that in some cultures, this is how you greet. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Like... By... Hands are very by touching the parts of the face, the nose. The mm-hmm. like that. Wow. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very much so. Uh, maybe m- less so with the hands and more so with the body. Mm-hmm. Does your son ever touch your foot, like with his leg or foot, if you're sitting next to each other? Mm. Does he lean some weight on you or something? He'll grab my arm, Hetri. I know this. He grab on my arm as if it's a teddy bear. <laughs> uh, yeah, if you see other child, you know, hugging a teddy bear, he was hugging my arm like it's a teddy bear. <laughs> some, some of these, I think, as we talk, they, they seem non-related, but they're actually part of this sensory, physical, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, yep. the things that they value, the connections that mm-hmm. they value, like physical touch and mm-hmm. that sort of aspect. Mm-hmm. Yep. Do any of our students that are on tonight, I think we still have a few, we have a couple minutes left You're here. You're getting that late. <laughs> no, there's some still here. Does anybody in our student group have a friend or family member that might be similar to the children we've been discussing tonight? Anybody? I just encourage the students, and because I do this with myself and with all people, to think about your own sensory preferences. Mm. So we all have sensory preferences. Some of us don't like strong light or we prefer strong light. We prefer listening to very loud music or we want to work in very silent uh, environments. Uh, We like a lot of space around us or we want to sit in a box and work. Um, These are all uh, personal uh, sensory preferences that um, impact the way we experience the world and how we uh, make meaning of it. And I think that when uh, in design, it's a, I don't know, because I'm not a designer, I come from psychology, but, uh, but, uh, but, um, but I think that this is a really important to uh, especially when designing for kids, to, but also for adults, actually, and also for uh, space uh, design, office design. Um, I know that all the students know about universal design. Um, so these are uh, very interesting elements when one um, designs for uh, 
people with with cool abilities. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and one can always think, I mean, start with yourself and think about what are my, uh, how do I like to be touched? Uh, do I like rough and tumble or do I prefer like gentle caressing? Uh, these are all uh, cues about uh, sensory uh, preferences that uh, one can um, see more with uh, less verbal or nonverbal um, people. Yeah, absolutely. Any, any final questions um, before we end our session tonight? Yeah, I have one. Great, go right ahead. Uh, Yingling, how is it working at Facebook? Uh, my work is never a dull moment. <laughs> Sounds like Facebook. <laughs> yes. Uh, really engaging, really busy, but lots of fun. And yeah, I love my job. And when I actually found out my son has autism, I was talking to a few friends and some people actually, they also have special needs family. The first thing I heard from multiple people was like, they were like, maybe you should quit your job and stay home and spend time with him. <laughs> it was really hard on me. And that's the moment I realized I love my job so much. And I felt like if I don't do it, then I will, told, I will be a disaster. And if I'm a disaster, I, I can't take care of him. <laughs> so even though I, at that point, I felt like I'm way too selfish, but I decided to stay in my job and be happy at work and bring my happiness at home. And because of that, I, but of course, I need to make change to my schedule. And uh, so I work really hard when I'm in office, making sure I get as much done as possible. And then when I'm home, when I'm 100% with them, when, I, when they're awake, I'm fully there. And then after they go to bed, like 8.30, <laughs> and that's the time I start to sometimes do some research, sometimes deal with the insurance, sometimes to change the schedule for therapies. And sometimes I read some books about, you know, things I need to learn and then maybe research and find out some program in Florida, another program in Santa Barbara, things I can learn and there's some conference actually this Saturday I'm going to. So I'm spending a lot of the, my time that's not working or not interacting with them time to learn this brand new domain. There's so much to learn. I f almost feel like it's a brand new degree I'm taking. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so it does affect a lot of my the, yeah, time but it's also something I feel like I really want to do. Yeah. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, and I don't, think, I don't know if you mentioned or not, but uh, how old is your child? Uh, four year old and six year old. Got it, thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Um, I guess if we have answered all questions, um, I would like to thank Yenling for joining us um, and sharing what is a very personal but very beautiful story and helping us understand um, the, the beauty and the cool abilities that you get to see every single day with your, your, your little son and all the light mm -hmm. that he brings to your life and the joy. Yeah. So thank mm -hmm. you so much. Thank you for having me. Yeah. <laughs> You're welcome. You're welcome. Um, um, I have recorded this uh, session tonight, mm -hmm. so I will make that link available to everybody. And um, please do think about what we have learned tonight. And like I said, thank you very much, Yen Ling. Uh, mm -hmm. This has been a great opportunity for us. Thank you. All right, everyone. Okay. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you again. Thank you.